Hi everybody, welcome to our event for the Being Human Festival. It's entitled Ethical Futures for a New World. I'm Felicity Plester. And I'm Vicky Peters. We are jointly editorial directors for Humanities Publishing at Palgrave Macmillan. This film is our contribution to the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities, which is now in its seventh year and convened by the School of Advanced Study of the University of London. We are very happy to contribute to it each year. And we usually have a live event in the lovely theatre space in our London office known as the Stables. But this year, things have to be a little different. So sadly, we're not able to offer you a glass of wine after the event, but neither do you have to trudge through the rain trying to find the entrance to our buildings, which has been the story for the last few years. We've held some wonderful events at the Being Human Festival over the years, showcasing some thought provoking and really quite brilliant pieces from our humanities authors. We've looked at topics such as gay history, aging, designer babies, scandal and fake news, to name but a few. This year, we have tried to turn our thoughts to what the future might look like after the pandemic particularly influenced by the Black Lives Matter movement and thinking about whether an ethical future really will be possible. We at Palgrave Macmillan are highly committed to publishing the humanities, but as well as publishing the very best in scholarly research, we are also committed to promoting public engagement within the humanities and encouraging interdisciplinary debate and discussion. And actually as a company, we've been doing this now for 175 years. We are involved in today's event through our campaign for the humanities, which is an ongoing suite of publications, promotions, web events and live events such as this. It is a campaign that is sponsored and supported passionately here by many individual employees as well as the company as a whole. And today we're delighted to introduce you to our four speakers. And one of the good things about doing this event as a film is we've not been constrained by the locations of our speakers, so we have a really international lineup. In a little while, we will hear from Zoe Bellatis, who is based at the University of Birmingham and is publishing a wonderful open access title with Palgrave and Millen called Value and the Humanities, which engages with 19th century writings and thought to develop a rationale for the importance of humanities today. Bruce Mutzvero is Professor of Journalism at Auburn University, Alabama, USA. He has written five books for Palgrave and is founding editor of our series Palgrave Studies in Journalism and the Global South. And next we have Anthony Pinn who is Agnes Cullen Arnold Professor of Humanities and Professor of Religion at Rice University in Texas. And his research interests include black religion, humanism and hip hop culture. And he has written and edited numerous books for Palgrave Macmillan over the years, most recently, Humanism and the Challenge of Difference. But we will start with Francesca Sabande, who is a lecturer in digital media studies at Cardiff University and has just this year published a book with Palgrave Macmillan on the digital lives of black women in Britain. We really hope you enjoy their pieces and that they give you plenty to think about. Hi, my name is Dr. Francesca Sabandi and I'm a lecturer in Digital Media Studies at the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University in Wales. When I think about new worlds and I think about what will hopefully be more ethical futures, I think about whose experiences and perspectives will be at the forefront of how new worlds are created. A lot of my own work focuses on digital culture and in particular the digital experiences of black people in Britain, especially black women. Right now, a lot of people's digital experiences involve them facing many forms of harm, harassment and abuse. In the future, I wonder how digital technology will develop. Will it be created in a way that focuses on minimizing the different forms of oppression that people encounter when trying to enjoy themselves online or connect with friends and family elsewhere? How will the future reckon with different questions to do with how inequality is perpetuated at both a local and national level? And in the future, how will transnational forms of solidarity take place? There are many examples of how digital technology is part of how people connect with others in another part of the world. We see different examples of people producing knowledge, sharing resources, standing in solidarity, and amplifying the work of grassroots organizers in a different geocultural context to themselves. As part of the research that I do, I look at the different ways that individuals and institutions align themselves with certain social justice movements, especially black activism and racial justice work. Although it's encouraging to have seen in recent months in 2020, different people speaking out about anti-blackness and the intersecting nature of oppression, and it's been encouraging to see certain organizations start to try to address how they are complicit in these forms of oppression. I'm still very skeptical of the extent to which commercial organizations are ever prioritizing people over profit. 
What does it mean to see organisations essentially try to capitalise on social justice movements and opportunistically tap into the different discussions we're seeing at play to do with inequality and who is worst impacted by it? Quite often conversations to do with racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transphobia and different forms of oppression are treated as though these issues are separate. But the reality is oppression is interconnected. The different way that somebody experiences life in comparison to another person is shaped by many facets of who they are. So what does this mean for new worlds and more ethical futures? In the future, I hope to see more policy and legislation that recognises the fact that oppression, it's entangled. We can't just think about issues to do with race as though they exist outside of capitalism, as though they exist outside of sexism, misogyny. What I would also like to see in the future is much more of a focus on the different ways that activities at a local level can play a central part in how people address injustice. Sometimes the way that international media flows work and the way that broadcast media works, we see that certain issues in one part of the world are much more at the focus of conversations in certain issues elsewhere. The work that people are doing at a grassroots local level is often overlooked, it's often erased. But in the future, I hope that we see many more conversations that adequately acknowledge the fact that the work that needs to be done, although it will be international in scope, requires some small and everyday changes at a very immediate and local level. What does this mean when we think about digital technology? This means that digital technology can play a great part in how people communicate the work that they're doing globally. But digital technology alone is not enough to address intersecting inequalities. In fact, as I've reflected on as part of my work, sometimes digital technology is part of the problem. So in the future, as part of these new worlds and these more ethical environments that we hope to see, one of my biggest hopes is that we see much less of a focus on consumer culture, capitalism, commodification and corporations, and much more of an emphasis on people, social connections, collective support and community engagement. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Bruce Mitzwairo. I am a professor of journalism at uh, Auburn University in the US state of Alabama. I'm just going to be talking to you about uh, my research and the opportunities that I've actually had to publish and collaborate with uh, uh, many colleagues who are working in the global south. And uh, obviously, this would have, it would have not been possible without the assistance of, of Palgrave. So yeah, it's uh, great to have an opportunity to talk about uh, this research. Now, um, I wanna talk to you, first of all, about uh, uh, data journalism. Obviously, all these issues, uh, they have to do with you know, the discussions and debates that are currently emerging insofar as uh, ethical features are contained, the way that people are using digital technologies, the impact that um, you know, these uh, technologies have. Obviously, on one hand, we have all seen how they help us, you know, to do uh, online shopping, how they help us uh, to find information when we want to go on holiday. Uh, obviously, we can't do with these technologies, but, you know, sometimes it's good to look at uh, these, uh, uh, you know, technologies from uh, a critical perspective. Uh, because, of course, uh, it's one thing uh, to use technologies um, and, of course, it's another to also think about the impact, especially the ne negative impact that uh, uh, such uses could have on individuals or collectively uh, uh, as a society. So um, most of the research that we have seen, or at, at least, you know, policy uh, uh, oriented research that, you know, we, we have seen in the global south, uh, maybe over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, you know, uh, has really looked at how these technologies are helping, uh, say, um, you know, African or Asian societies. Um, and and it's, it's certainly, it's clearly uh, uh, true that, you know, uh, like people in the West are benefiting from these technologies. Many people, many farmers, for example, in Kenya, you know, they can use apps to, you know, to, to, to just um, um, uh, deposit their cash, 
you know, they don't need to be in the uh, capital city, Nairobi. So uh, obviously that's, uh, th there is more to benefit from these technologies. But what we've tried to do, uh, myself and my colleagues, has been to also look at, uh, you know, the, the, the other side of the coin. Um, uh, that is to say that, for instance, uh, you know, uh, digital technologies in as much as they are quite ubiquitous in many of these societies. Um, the other problem is, of course, the fact that uh, some people do not have the um, capacities or they are actually digitally illiterate. So it's always, of course, something that is not always easily noticeable, especially if you try to look at these uh, issues from a Western perspective where almost everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, 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 and or, or at least understands how to, you know, to use these technologies. So uh, digital illiteracy, the uh, fact that also, you know, the, the, you know, having access to these uh, technologies is quite expensive. It's, it's, it, it makes it really uh, more an elite oriented sort of project for many people, because, you know, if you are living in a poverty stricken environment, then uh, certainly, uh, you know, one of the, uh, uh, maybe last things that you want to do is to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to try and digitally participate because obviously you want to first put food on the table and we have seen, you know, the impact or we have seen, uh, uh, you know, conducting research in these societies, we've actually seen how people are struggling, uh, um, you know, to, to, to make uh, ends meet uh, when perhaps, you know, they actually uh, have or are struggling to also perhaps uh, try to have access to these digital technologies because internet access, for example, is very expensive and internet access is only limited perhaps to some environments, some urban environment. So it means that those who are living in rural settings do not really have access to these technologies. But also digital, uh, uh, well, rather data, you know, the, the, you know, we are now living in a data-driven society. So, you know, uh, uh, a book that I did most recently with Paul Grave um, uh, focused on, 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 on uh, data journalism in the global south. And we are starting to see there are a lot of initiatives uh, that are coming up um, where, you know, journalists uh, in, in the global south are starting also to look into how they can, they possibly could use data to try and improve their uh, journalistic practices. Uh, but of course, there are some emerging perspectives and problems, of course, associated uh, with this data, one of which is the fact that some governments do not really have any data to share with journalists at all. Uh, so, you know, there is in that, uh, in such instances, there isn't any um, data journalism to talk about. Uh, um, uh, but also sometimes, you know, uh, uh, there are issues that have to do with the ethics uh, uh, of data. You know, uh, the fact that, you know, people do not really give their consent uh, uh, to the information that might actually be shared with journalists. Um, you know, it's it's something that perhaps nobody's talking about right now, uh, at least in, 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 in some of the societies that I'm working in. Uh, but these are very critical issues, which, you know, uh, many uh, people here in the West are, are, are really talking about and are trying to find answers to. Uh, but not only that, I think uh, what we also see is, you know, some societies or some, some non-democratic states uh, which obviously have refused to introduce the um, uh, access to um, or Freedom of Information Act, which allows, of course, citizens to, uh, you know, to request any information from public institutions. Uh, that makes it really hard for journalists living in these countries to try and have access uh, uh, or to investigate um, you know, what, whatever is happening. As we actually saw with the Panama Papers, uh, and what we saw with the Panama Papers is, of course, uh, there was that collaborative spirit uh, among journalists. But, uh, you know, in, my, in some of these societies, we see that the collaborative culture is not part of, uh, you know, uh, their society. So it becomes really hard for journalists to collaborate and work together. 
um, uh, and you know uh, other issues, of course, that are coming up, especially with regards to uh, these you know ethical features, have to do with ethic, uh, you know, with digital coloniality. You know, the fact that you know when Google comes into uh, Kenya and comes up with an, initi an initiative that is meant to assist the locals. Uh, you know, who actually has, uh, um, um, you know, who looks up, to, uh, up, you know, who looks after that data? Uh, do people really have the consent? Do people really know what is going to happen to, uh, to their data? So data, you know, uh, a digital coloniality is something that is also up and coming in these environments that I and of course others are working into. Um, yeah, I think uh, on that note, I would like to bring this to an end and thank you very much for listening. Hi there, my name is Zoe Belitis and I work at the University of Birmingham. There is no wealth but life. If I had to identify one part of my experience of the global coronavirus pandemic that has made me reflect differently on my research and in connection to this idea of ethical futures, it's best represented in this phrase from John Ruskin's essay, Unto This Last, first published in 1860, now well over 150 years ago, in which he argues that there is no wealth but life. It seems to me that in the various collective and individual ways in which human beings have been disrupted, distanced, damaged and devastated this year, the value of life itself has been brought into the foreground of conscious thought and public debate. As a writer and educator interested in articulating the value of studying the humanities, specifically through the tools afforded by studying literature and critical theory, I think that this global refocusing on the value of human life and what we choose to do with it is really important. In many ways, Ruskin's statement that there is no wealth but life is being experienced every day at both individual and wider societal levels, sometimes as a barrier um, and sometimes as this reminder of our collective humanity. In England, the national lockdown in March increased, uh, it placed increased scrutiny on our daily lives and what constitutes meaningful living. This pause for many created a chance to reflect on the previous pressures constituent of that life we now point back to as being normal. And in contrast to this, the comprehension of the limits and opportunities of our present time, our new normal, as politicians have been calling it, um, alongside what it is that we want life to look like and mean moving forwards. Speaking as an individual in this global context, I spent a lot of time looking backwards and assessing what I did before, as much, if not more than, I've spent thinking about moving towards the future, ethical or not. But to turn to wider, and really in this I mean uh, political levels, we find that the preservation of human life is in competition with other values. These are largely our support for the economy, and the ambitions of national futures in terms of productivity, employment um, and profit. Uh, it's not my intention to diminish or dismiss the effects of these problems at all. The long-term effects of the global financial crisis in 2008-2009 have had widespread um, effects, especially in those parts of the world that have pursued austerity measures and cuts to public spending. These effects are to human lives as well as the economy. But I am nonetheless troubled by the part of public debate and how much of the public debate has centred um, around the, the coronavirus around the economy. Um, I, I argue that in the language of schemes like Eat Out to Help Out, we see how individuals who are trying to navigate these kind of global uncertainties and personal risks are being called upon in national communications to first and foremost respond um, by spending money. This is nothing about the wider spectrum of ways in which we might otherwise help out. My academic writing and research interrogates this rise of a focus on economic language as the primary motivation of policymaking and public value in England. And so perhaps it's unsurprising that I'm so attentive to this kind of economic call to arms. Palgrave recently published my first book, Value and the Humanities, the Neoliberal University and our Victorian Inheritance, which provides an account of the entanglements between this increasingly economically oriented policymaking and the value of the humanities from the 19th to the 21st century in England. And I'm 
interested in the failure of markets to account for the lived experience and alternative ethical considerations we value as human beings. Throughout my book, I challenge the idea that this primary focus on economic value in the context of universities specifically is unavoidable, natural or necessary. In Value in the Humanities, I demonstrate through a wide range of real life uh, examples drawn from education, museum studies, policy and public debate, how the value of a university education should not, historically has not and ethically cannot be measured in exclusively economic terms. My interest in writing this book arose from the belief that the economy cannot account for human lives and in focusing exclusively on the effects of human activity um, within the context of numerical and fiscal terms, a far larger set of ethical questions are overlooked. On the specific topic of higher education, um, these include but not limited to what is the purpose of education, who is it for, who does it exclude, what is the connection between universities and the places in which they're located, who and what are we responsible for as educators? And as the cost of tuition fees tripled, um, I watched student identities being forcibly reframed as consumers of education, rather than them being participants in an open and international community motivated to change society for the better. And this mismatch between economic values and what actually matters reveals an important idea which requires further attention if we're to take seriously this task of creating ethical futures. The idea of challenging where the language of economic policy making is ill suited to human need. The coronavirus pandemic has brought this failure uh, to light in many new ways I think uh, and even if those are currently only being perceived at the level of, of individuals but I don't think it takes writing a book on the limitations of neoliberal governance to know and even be able to articulate the many and various conflicting and contradictory pulls of the present pandemic time. Major social and, and grassroots movements, however, have found firmer footing within this absence of business as usual, um, from the Black Lives Matter protests around the world to smaller scale community action around food banks, a new relationship to working and urban environments, as well as a kind of renewed attention to living sustainably. I remain hopeful that these individual and collective experiences that we're going through at the moment will expose how the old normal is not the ideal. And the definition of new normal need not only address economic ends, but speak to a future of diverse human flourishing. But I acknowledge it's not easy to think or talk about the future, especially when in the midst of a crisis. To invoke the theme of this festival, being human, uh, and, the and to focus in on this um, panel on ethical futures, I want to close by offering the following provocations. That thinking beyond the limits of economically focused policy requires skills which studying and thinking in the humanities provides. Ethical futures are things that we all have a stake in, and small acts can accumulate into larger ones. I also think that we need to emphasize how we need the humanities as much as we need economic metrics in moving forwards towards an ethical future. And the first task at hand in this is to close read and critically analyze the current political debate, televised addresses, newspaper columns, and to begin to historicize our present inevitables into um, something that is a matter of contingency to challenge the rapidly solidifying new normal um, as a matter of both individual and governmental choices. Why? Well, I think that because at the end of all bluster, all graphs, all debate, that there is no wealth but life. Thank you. Hello, I'm delighted to be with you. My name is Anthony Penn. I'm the Agnes Cullen Arnold Professor of Humanities and Professor of Religion at Rice University in Houston, Texas, United States. Much of my work and virtually all of what I've published with Paul Grave McMillan revolves around two questions that have been important to me in my teaching and my research for the better part of 25 years. Here they are. In a US society marked by anti-Black racism and violence, but promising democratic possibilities, how do African Americans think and act in a way that suggests they are free and full participants in the best the nation offers. How do African Americans think themselves, practice themselves free? 
Now, my formal training, it's important to say, is in theology. And so I was trained to wrestle with questions about the nature of God, the nature of the human, the meaning of salvation, those sorts of questions. But I quickly learned that I could not understand the nature and meaning of Black life in the United States using just one academic tool in the same way that you cannot build a house with just a hammer. And so rather than just doing theology, I started giving some attention to philosophy, history, other disciplines that helped me to point out and understand the complexities of Black life, the messy nature of life within the context of the United States. Much of this revolves around how we think about a future that is moral, ethical, and that is geared towards our best selves. Now, one of the figures who's been so very vital in my thinking, so very important to me, is Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, first African American to graduate from Harvard, one of the founding figures in the field of sociology, in his perhaps most important text, The Souls of Black Folk, he raises two questions. The first, what is to be done with the Negro? Secondly, how does it feel to be a problem? Now keep in mind that Du Bois is asking these questions at the beginning of the 20th century in light of Reconstruction and its failure. Keep in mind, after the Civil War in the United States, Reconstruction was meant to put in place social, economic, and political opportunities for freed African Americans that would allow them to not only think about a future as possible, but to begin to construct one. Reconstruction fails. And we're left with those two questions. What is to be done with the Negro, and how does it feel to be a problem. Now, I've always argued there are at least two really important orientations for answering those questions. Within Black communities, the first is Black religion. And you can think in terms of the Black church in that most religious African Americans are Christian. Within the context of the Black church, the, these questions have been wrestled with typically in this way. They have understood themselves as being created in the image of God with all of the capacities, capabilities, and rights that God grants. And that any country, the United States, that understands itself to be about the development of our best inclinations ought to be able to appreciate this. And the Black church not only preached that understanding, but activism within the Black church was meant to bring it about. Think in terms of the religious leanings moving forward of the civil rights movement, the ways in which religious sensibilities, religious ideas were used to encourage the United States to be its better self. Even the more recent Black Lives Matter movement in the United States has some of this religious underpinning. But here's the problem. That thinking, that outcome-driven thinking, has not produced the sorts of changes we have envisioned. And here's where the second possibility comes into place. The possibility that I spend a lot of time trying to unpack in my Pell Grave publications, that possibility is Black humanism. I argue while a significant percentage of Black Americans have been Christian, we've forgotten to appreciate those who have claimed no religion, who understand themselves as being fully and solely accountable and responsible for how they move through the world. No God, just themselves. W.E.B. Du Bois is one of these figures who did not rely on God, but understood that humans have the capacity to do things differently, to project futures that are worthwhile and nurturing. The great abolitionist Frederick Douglass also maintain this orientation. And I'm paraphrasing here, but Frederick Douglass saw, says something along these lines, that he did not see the benefit of prayer until he learned to pray with his legs. That is to say, what became important to him was not appeal to religion, appeal to God, but appeal to his ability to make a difference in the world. I've spent a lot of time trying to develop a historical map that outlines the development of this humanism from the early presence of enslaved and free Africans in North America to the 21st century. 
one of the benefits I see in trying to respond to those two initial questions I posed through humanism, again, is the strong attention to human accountability and responsibility that we have to do something. I also find of value the ways in which Black humanism is more responsive to the nature, the content of U.S. history. That despite our best efforts, we have remained a country deeply soiled by anti-Black racism. Black humanism argues that rather than an outcome-driven strategy, we ought to see something about our projection of the future tied not to outcomes, but the process. That is to say that we may never liberate this country from all of its wrongdoing, all of its poor thinking, but that there is something of value, something of meaning, something importance in the very effort to say no to injustice. Now, one of the great humanist thinkers is that North African Albert Camus. And he provides an example in the myth of Sisyphus. Perhaps you're familiar with it. According to this myth, Sisyphus is being punished by the gods for wrongdoing. And this punishment involves his need to roll this rock up a hill only to have it come back down. And then he'll have to roll it up again, and this is forever. From the perspective of the gods, this was meant to break his will. But Camus argues it didn't, that it fostered a moment of awareness, of lucidity. That is to say, Sisyphus became better aware, more deeply appreciative of his circumstances. And rather than projecting an outcome as the final mark of his effort having value. It's simply his ability to continue against the odds to try. And so in my work on humanism, I've argued that this is an underappreciated strategy. If our concern is how we think about ethical futures, humanism provides an alternate approach, a different posture towards this work that again recognizes not outcome-driven strategies, but the value the importance, the significance in our very effort to make a difference. It recognizes that we may not win the day, but there is something powerful, something humanizing in our persistent no to injustice. And it may simply be the case that all we can really hope for, all we can achieve is a persistent and loud no to injustice, a no to injustice that points it out and encourage us, encourages us to be our better selves. Thanks so much. And that concludes our presentations for today. I'd like to say a really big thank you to our speakers, Francesca, Zoe, Bruce, and Anthony, and I very much hope you enjoyed it.